Welcome to this Thompson Hine webinar, Uncharted Territory, New Employment Issues Raised by the Pandemic. My name is Megan Glowacki. I'm a partner in the Thompson Hine Labor and Employment Practice. I'm delighted to be your MC today and to introduce other of my employment colleagues that will be presenting today. Keith Spiller is with me in the Cincinnati office. Debbie Brenneman is in our Dayton office. Brian Stillwagon and Sarah Hamilton, both from our Atlanta office, and Hannah Caldwell from our Cleveland location. We know that many of our clients and many of you have been educating yourself on these new and very complex COVID-19 related issues since March. And while most organizations have a baseline for how to handle COVID-19 related employment issues, Often, the devil is in the details. Today, we're going to go beyond the surface and get into those details on a set of COVID-19 topics challenging almost every workplace. We have a robust presentation to get through today as a result. Time permitting, we will cover questions at the end of the webinar. Please note that the webinar is being recorded, and we will send a link to all attendees along with the slides within 48 hours of today's presentation. Thank you for your interest. We're going to begin today's webinar discussing COVID-19 related absences and requests for leave. To kick us off, I will hand it over to Debbie Brenneman in our Dayton office to discuss the very hot topic of handling COVID-19 exposure in the workplace. Debbie, take it away. Thank you, Megan. Thank you very much, Megan. Uh, yes, handling COVID exposure in the workplace is certainly uh, something that is top of mind for all employers. And I want to talk about a few different topics as we uh, navigate through this issue. First is uh, taking employee temperatures. I, many employers are already doing this, but there are still some things to keep in mind with regard to employee temperatures and continuing to take them. Uh, be aware, uh, if you are physically taking employee temperatures in the workplace, that there may be an obligation under wage and hour laws to pay employees for time spent doing that. Um, you want to consider social distancing issues and certainly privacy issues. If you're maintaining a log of temperatures, those type of documents need to be protected just like any other medical documentation. So ensure that your policies are requiring that. Uh, we have had a number of employers who are uh, going with something beyond uh, temperature taking and using new technologies such as cameras and facial recognition technology. Uh, if you do that, that can be particularly effective and speed up the screening. Uh, but those, especially, you need to make sure that necessary disclosures have been made and, if applicable, proper consents are obtained. Because while body temperature alone is not biometric information, Face scans and fingerprints are. So if you're using uh, this type of technology, you want to make sure you're compliant with state laws that may require you to provide adequate notice and, in some cases, affirmative consent before collecting that type of biometric information. So a great technology, but other requirements that, to make sure that you are uh, not violating any local or state uh, laws when you're doing that. Some employers are also conducting tests for their employees for COVID-19, and the EEOC has opined that that is permissible as well, as long as the tests are accurate and reliable. Uh, the CDC actually describes strategies for uh, employer-based COVID-19 testing in a variety of, of different categories, including testing individuals with signs or symptoms consistent with COVID-19, testing asymptomatic individuals with recent exposures, um, testing asymptomatic individuals who've been in certain uh, special settings, or testing to determine resolution of infection. If you do decide to or are embarking on some sort of testing uh, requirements in your workplace or screening requirements, just as anything else, make sure that these tests are conducted on a non-discriminatory basis. That may be that all employees entering the workplace are tested uh, over a certain stretch of time. It may be that employees who have been exposed are tested, but make sure that you have a policy and parameters in place and that those are being followed. And of course, 
again, make sure that any uh, documentation regarding those results uh, is kept in accordance with ADA requirements. Megan, let's go to the next screen. Let's talk about handling signs of illness that do occur in the workplace. And most employers or many, many employers have now faced that, that incident where someone does have has uh, reported that they uh, that they do have COVID or that they have some symptoms of COVID. So if you have employees with temperatures that exceed 100.4 degrees, uh, they need to be sent home. Uh, if they arrive at work, become sick during the day, they should be immediately separated from other employees, customers, and visitors, and sent home. Uh, that's whether they have reported to you on their own or um, these are observed by your screening processes or self-observation of the employees. Uh, sick employees should then fo follow CDC recommended steps, as well as making sure you're mindful of state and local rules. Employees should not return to work until they have met the criteria to discontinue home isolation, whether that be by your state or local requirements or by CDC guidance. Um, it's important that you do have a designated contact for employees who are feeling ill, whether they have been working remotely uh, periodically or, or, or on an ongoing basis or not. That helps ensure that you do have a consistent application of your policy. Um, that ensures that you have a person who can monitor what the particular local and state requirements are for your business and make sure that um, your procedures are handled on a consistent basis. Next screen, please. It's also important in terms of handling signs of illness that you do have a plan in place if an employee or when an employee is diagnosed with COVID-19. Uh, you need to make sure, again, you're following guidelines set by state and local authorities. That very well may include notifying the local health department and facilitating contact tra tracing. Uh, certainly, you also need to notify employees and potentially other th third parties who have been in contact with that sick employee. Due to privacy concerns, it's important that you don't provide that name. It may be that that person is in a very small group of employees and other employees may well figure that out, uh, who the employee is when, when the individual is absent. But it's important for privacy concerns that you as the employer are not providing that identification. And you may, uh, you will want to consider a shutdown or at least sanitation of the uh, premises where the employee was. It may not be your whole facility. If the employee, for instance, uh, works in the warehouse and never comes into the main parts of, of your facility, you might be able to limit that sanitation and, and shut down to the, to the warehouse itself. But it's important for a couple of reasons, certainly to protect the safety of other employees and also to make sure that they feel like you are taking all steps that are necessary to appropriately handle signs of illness in the workplace. Next page. And it's also important when you deal with outbreaks in the workplace to make sure that you are uh, following proper quarantine guidance. The CDC has specific guidance of who should be quarantined. That includes both individuals who have symptoms or have been diagnosed with COVID. Uh, CDC guidance also includes people who have been in close contact with someone who, who does have COVID-19. Uh, that excludes people who have had COVID-19 within the past three months. Uh, but the CDC quarantine guidance for these groups of people is to stay home for 14 days after their last contact with a person who has COVID, to watch for that fever, cough, or other symptoms, uh, including uh, uh, loss of, uh, of the sense of smell or taste, and, of course, staying away from other folks who may be uh, vulnerable to that. Next screen. The CDC's definition of close contact is anyone who's been within six feet of someone who has COVID-19 for a total of 15 minutes or more. So as an employer, if someone in the, in the workplace has uh, not just that they're in the same cube or that the, they're in the same environment, but if they over a period of time have had a total of 15 minutes or more of close contact with someone, then that, uh, that person would be under CDC guidance to quarantine. Uh, close contact also is if you're providing care at home to someone who's sick, you have direct physical contact, sharing um, eating or drinking utensils, and of course, uh, being infected by respiratory droplets. Uh, consistency is key here. Next screen. 
Uh, with regard to individuals who have tested positive for COVID-19, the CDC is saying they do not need to quarantine or get tested again for up to three months, but that's only as long as they don't develop additional symptoms. Um, people who do develop symptoms again within that three-month time frame, the CDC is, is, is saying that they should be tested again, but there's this window of three months that the CDC says you've tested positive, you're not going to need to quarantine or get that test again for that three-month period of time. Hey, Debbie, this is Megan. I've got a quick question for you on that. This is just a CDC guideline, right? Sure. Let's say, for example, the employee tests positive for COVID-19. Two months later, they take leave for a child who tested positive. An employer can still require a negative COVID-19 test by that employee before they return to work, even if the CD says that test is unnecessary. Do you agree with that? I, I do, Megan, uh, for a couple of reasons. First, um, you know, even in this definition, the CDC is saying, well, you've got this three-month bubble, but hey, if you do develop symptoms, you may need to be tested again. So they're recognizing that this is not absolute. It's not fail-safe. Uh, and the EEOC is saying you can test your employees. So again, theoretically, in this circumstance, you could. I think consistency is the key. In the scenario that you mentioned, it would be important to have uh, that apply consistency. So if, it, if you only test those who take leave, take leave to care for a family member, and not those who have a family member at home who has COVID, but they, they're not caring for them, that could lead to an allegation that the employer is interfering with leave rights. So consistency is key, but I absolutely agree that that, that uh, ability exists. And let's move on to the next screen. With regard to um, folks that are quarantining, when do you have to pay them? If they are being quarantined, what is triggered? Well, a couple of things are at, at play here. First of all, of course, is the FFCRA, which we've all become very familiar with. Go to the next screen. And under the FFCRA, uh, one of the reasons that you would be obligated to, to pay leave, if you are an employer with fewer than 500 employees, is if the paid sick leave um, the employee is unable to work because he or she is quarantined under a government order or the advice of a health care provider or is experiencing COVID-related symptoms and seeking diagnosis. So if you send an employee home because they're exposed and, are, uh, and you as an employer are subject to the FFCRA, is leave triggered? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. If it's a state order of quarantine or a local order of quarantine, then yes, FFCRA leave would be triggered. If it's a guidance or a recommendation, probably not. But you also want to factor in state and local requirements. Uh, many of those do impose additional paid leave requirements. I believe Michigan, for instance, requires paid leave in the event of exposure. So you're always going to want to, to make sure you're consulting those state and local leave laws as well. Next screen. Even if you aren't subject to FFCRA uh, because you're a large employer or maybe you have and are, are subject to some of the exemptions, many employers are considering voluntary paid leave uh, for employers who uh, employees who are quarantined, partic particularly when it's an employer requested quarantine. Uh, one recent study showed that about 50% of two of the 250 employers surveyed had implemented an expanded paid leave policy and another 11% were considering such an expansion. Four out of five employers who participated in that study um, had, an ex had extended their sick leave or PTO policy so that it was applicable to all employees, although some specified only for COVID-related reasons. Next screen. With regard to voluntary payments, the motivation for some employers is simply to do the right thing. Um, and other employers are also concerned that voluntary payment does encourage employees to be honest. Um, they simply don't want employee making that tough decision between needing the paycheck and showing up for work, even though they've been exposed, uh, and risking that, that exposure to more employees in the workplace and dealing with a fallout of that as well. If you do decide to uh, make voluntary quarantine payments, you really do want to make sure that you are thinking about that policy before you implement it. For instance, will quarantine employees continue to accrue vacation or will you stop that accrual? You may choose to uh, provide only partial 
wage payments, but if you do, you have to make sure that you're complying with wage and hour laws such as minimum wage rules and other requirements for exempt uh, employee status. Also, with regard to those payments, you need to make sure that they're not characterized as bonuses because that could uh, have an impact on the way that you're calculating your regular rate of pay for non-exempt employees in the future and could impact your overtime requirements. And unless you want to make sure that this is a permanent arrangement, you want to put an expiration date on that policy. You may need to extend it, and that's fine, but that's easier to do than lead employees to believe that this is a permanent change in their benefits. Once employees uh, are finished with quarantine, whether it's because they have exposure or uh, they've been sent home um, because they've been in contact with folks, what can you do with regard to medical uh, clearance? You can require uh, that employees who are ill with COVID or who are quarantined provide medical clearance to return to work. Um, EEOC has said that that is appropriate, um, that is, uh, but there is a, a, a a suggestion that employers be flexible with the type of medical clearance that you require. Maybe not a traditional doctor's note because employers are very busy, uh, physicians are very busy right now. It may be something more like a telehealth form, but you absolutely could um, and should be requiring some type of medical clearance before employees do return to work. We're also in return to school season and that has a whole host of leave issues. So I will turn it over to Megan at this point to discuss uh, what happens as your employees deal with how to care for children who have very questionable return to school situations. Thanks, Debbie. Yep, again, this is Megan Glowacki. I'm going to talk about employee requests for leave due to a child's school closing, due to COVID-19, perhaps due to a child that's involved in remote learning, or who cannot attend school because of a COVID-19 quarantine. And importantly, we'll try to differentiate today between what is required of employers and what is voluntary for employers to offer. So briefly setting the stage in case you've forgotten what it was like in the spring of 2020 somehow, if you've completely blocked it from your mind, we were in a complete school shutdown closure situation for the majority of the country. At the same time, non-essential business closures were occurring in some states, and we had significant teleworking. Under the FFCRA, which Debbie just went through and which will be um, referenced throughout our presentation here, Federal leave was mandated in certain circumstances as well. Transitioning to today, as we approach the opening of schools for the fall semester of 2020, we've got a very different situation. Schools may be fully reopened, utilizing blended learning, and in case you haven't read up on what blended learning means, that can involve some combination of students doing in-person school activities during the week, as well as at-home remote learning activities, or the schools could be fully remote. And what we're experiencing is are those choices vacillating between uh, those three options and those choices being either at the school's direction or at your employee's option. Concurrently, we have a lot of businesses that are now open. They've either returned essential and non-essential workers on site or have decided that they are ready to return all workers um, on, to on-site working sort of in waves. And at this point, that FFCRA leave may be exhausted for some employees or inapplicable. I'm not sure we were this happy in the spring semester, but at least at that point there was some hope that things would be complicated for only a short period of time. Today's reality may be complete chaos for some of your employees, and unfortunately we're looking at that chaos for an indeterminate amount of time. So let's start, as I said, with the requirements. At the federal level, um, with respect to requests for leave to address child school closures or the need for care closures, for employees with more than 500 employees, there are really no federal requirements. 
only if your organization has less than 500 employees do you need to consider whether the FFCRA applies to a leave request. That's at the federal level. However, to complicate things more than they already have been, some states and municipalities have passed paid sick leave laws that are triggered by a COVID-19 related event or absence, much like they might be triggered under the FFCRA, but the local leave laws do not have a maximum employee threshold and were in fact implemented to try to address or get at those employers who weren't subject to the FFCRA. Now, right now, most of those local laws are in California, but I say this as a warning because as the fall continues and as we continue to see COVID-19 hotspots pop up in certain jurisdictions or geographic areas, you'll want to keep this on your radar in case additional locations uh, municipalities decide that it's worthwhile in their, uh, within their jurisdiction of um, uh, where they can mandate these types of things, that they are going to add on additional paid sick leave type requirements. So again, under the FFCRA, we're talking about the two specific buckets of leave, the 80 hours of paid sick leave, that can be used if a child is out of school because of a school closure or a, a, a need to care closure. And then we're also talking about the 10 additional weeks of expanded family and medical leave, as Debbie mentioned earlier. I do want to highlight that these um, leave buckets only apply if an employee cannot telework. If an employee is capable of working from home while their child is in remote learning, the FFCRA does not apply. A couple of things to think about in terms of the FFCRA. Employees are not starting from scratch in terms of the amount of leave that is available to them starting fall semester. So there is no new 80 hours or 10 weeks of leave, whatever balance your employees utilized for the spring semester or frankly over the summer transfers into this fall semester. They do not get a brand new bucket of leave. However, an employee's ability to use FFCRA leave and whether or not they could use it in the spring doesn't necessarily affect if that employee can use FFCRA leave this fall. So for example, an employee may have been able to use leave under the FFCRA for, small, for fall semester, um, even if they were able to work in person or remotely during the spring semester. So while we're not thinking of a leave balance as brand new, you should be thinking about eligibility as being uh, brand new for the fall semester. So don't discount employees who did not use FFCRA leave previously when they may ask you for it this fall. I think it's probably most helpful to address specific examples of how to handle common leave requests. So although there can be an infinite number of variations on this, I'll talk about three specific examples or scenarios. The first being that school is open, but a child must quarantine due to illness of that child or another classmate, teacher, et cetera. Second scenario is that school is in blended learning, either by school or parent choice. And then third, that the school is in full remote learning, either by school or parent choice. And these options, to understand them, we really have to go through what the DOL has said about child care leave. And specifically, they've clarified that if a child care provider or school is open to some students, but not necessarily to that employee's students due to capacity, other COVID-related limitations, the school or child care provider is still considered closed to that student who is unable to attend. So what does this mean in terms of our scenarios? If school is fully open for in-person learning, 
FFTRA is not available unless, and this should say unless perhaps, the child is not able to attend school because of a quarantine due to, due to a COVID-19 related illness. It's important to understand that um, if the school is open, generally speaking, FFCRA leave should not be available. That being said, when we look at the DOL's definition of closed, it's arguable that the school is closed to that employee or to that employee's child because of the quarantine. So we are looking for more clarification from the Department of Labor because this is a broader reading of the closed definition than the DOL has ever provided. But suffice it to say, if school is open but an, an employee approaches you indicating that their child is now required to quarantine because the school has required them to remote learn or requires that they be out for a 14 or 10 day period of time, um, at that point, uh, we should be considering whether FFCRA leave is available to that person. Okay, for our Megan, scenario this number is, two. Well, I think you're, get, you're yeah, getting sorry, maybe to this answer. Megan, can I stop you before you get to this? This is Debbie. Uh, sure. Would you agree with me, and you're getting to an important question here about uh, option, but uh, with respect to blended and remote learning, would you agree that employers are permitted to ask employees whether children have the option to attend school in person and whether the employee made the choice to keep the child in a home learning environment? Yeah, that's a great question, Debbie. Since FFCRA leave is going to perhaps depend on that decision, whether it was mandated by the school or whether it was selected by the parent, I do think it's fair to ask those background questions. Um, as you are perfectly leading into here, whether or not FFCRA leave is available for blended learning or fully remote likely depends on whether it was mandatory for that employee's child or not. So for both blended learning, and remember blended learning means that for a couple of school days that child is either at home for all or part of the day, or for a fully remote learning experience where the school is open theoretically, but the children are not allowed in school, uh, I, I believe that the FFCRA would be required in terms of leave. However, if the answer is that a parent employee chose blended learning or fully remote when the employee had the option to send their child in person, the answer is probably not in terms of whether FFCRA leave is available. Uh, as if you have been following the FFCRA closely, the Department of Labor has kept an ongoing question and answer log. And I think at this point, there's 90 to 100 questions in this Q&A. And unfortunately for, for lawyers like us, the Q&A changes uh, sort of on an ongoing basis without there being a lot of redlining or obviousness to how the DOL has changed their questions and answers. And this is one of those examples. So initially, the Department of Labor teed up this scenario by saying, if a child's school or place of care is moved to online instruction or to another model in which children are expected or required to complete assignments at home, as a club. And the DOL provided the first and still current answer to that question. But initially, the Department of Labor also included the paragraph in red, which focused on the physical location. And it really said specifically that if students are invited to return in person, then a choice by the parent employee to instead select a remote learning option will not result in the employee having a qualifying reason for child care leave under the FFCRA. Since then, the DOL has deleted this paragraph in red, leaving many employers and lawyers to scratch their hand and wonder whether that is still applicable 
or whether the DOL intends to change their stance on that. So that is why this is in the probably not category. So throwing a wrench in these hypotheticals, if uh, an employee communicates to you that they have had, they've had the choice of whether to send their child to school in person or remotely, and they selected that fully remote option because of the child's underlying health condition, would FFCRA or other leave be applicable? And the answer is perhaps. I think in that circumstance, you need to consider whether traditional FMLA leave may apply due to the need to care for a child with a serious health condition. If that serious health condition um, prevents the child from physically going to school. So each of those situations may be on a case-by-case -case basis and would likely depend on the FMLA paperwork. But don't ignore all of the other leave possibilities simply because of the unique situation. So a couple of final thoughts on the FFCRA. You know, don't forget the small business exception or exemption. If you have less than 50 employees, you may be exempt from the paid sick leave and uh, emergency FMLA for child care leave if that leave would jeopardize the viability of the business. Sarah Hamilton is going to address further in this presentation documentation under the FFCRA leave, but it is important to require documentation um, to support their need for leave. And then finally, don't forget that EFMLA can be taken intermittently if the employer agrees. So if employees are in a blended learning situation or if the, the children are in a remote learning situation and your employee can utilize uh, another child care provider for part of the time, you as the employer have the right to agree to allow that employee to say take two days a week of EFMLA, EFMLA or to utilize it in half day increments or to frankly be creative to um, enable the employee to utilize their leave. So we finished talking about what's required, but obviously employers can go beyond what is required. And when there are no statutory requirements, a number of our clients have been considering some of the following alternatives. Using the FFCRA as a guideline for leave, even though no federal tax credit is going to be received for the paid leave time. Implementing an alternative leave program or considering other flexible options and benefits. And in terms of the alternative program, most of our clients who are thinking about this are looking at something less than a 12 or 10 week period. For example, considering six weeks of either paid or unpaid leave for parents who need to assist with their child's remote learning experience. There are some warnings, obviously, with any company provided benefits, and Debbie mentioned it, I will mention it, others will mention it, consistency is key. Beware of allowing individual manager discretion as to who gets leave and who does not. That can feel inherently unfair to some employees for whom that leave is denied. And frankly, be aware of employee relations issues from employees without school age children if the six weeks of potentially paid leave is available to them, but not to others. With respect to other flexible options and benefits, you know, nothing should be off the table as we consider how we can work most effectively this fall. There are a number of ways to do this, but continuing to think about remote options and adopting flex scheduling and flex Scheduling can mean, you know, shifting an employee's schedule who normally works from 8 to 5 to something that works from uh, 6 in the morning till 3 in the afternoon or some alternative to that. Think about whether job shares or shift trades should be more prevalent or can be more prevalent. For manufacturing or other types of schedules, think of whether 
410 or 312 schedule might work for some of your um, operations. And then you may have seen in the news, it's, it's always popular, what the very big tech companies are doing for their employees, including um, recently announced child care support for employees, either on site through partnerships with daycares or online care providers, or for last minute needs. But most importantly, as we go through this fall, communicate with your employees specifically those employees who have challenges due to the start of school. What are your expectations? What is their availability? What options are open to those employees? And ongoing communication will be key to success this fall. With that, I'll turn things over to Brian Stillwagon in our Atlanta office and Hannah Caldwell in our Cleveland office to discuss handling COVID-19 requests for accommodation. Brian? All right, thanks so much, Megan. Appreciate it. So Megan's uh, portion was a good lead in here because we're talking about uh, various new forms of leave, and she was touching also on the FMLA. And you and your businesses, I'm sure, are facing more unemployment questions than you've ever had in the past. You're probably trying to figure out how short-term disability weighs into this. Um, but something that we need to keep in mind throughout all of this is our old friend, the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, a few weeks ago, it celebrated its 30th anniversary of being passed. And so I think it's worth doing a quick refresher on what this act requires and specifically how it might have an impact on the current COVID crisis and uh, specifically employees looking for assistance in various ways. So. So to go back and look at the ADA, it uh, prohibits employment discrimination against qualified individuals with disabilities, a qualified individual with a disability. So what, is, what does that mean? First, disability is extremely broad. So keep this in mind because you're going to hear a lot from your employees about uh, various conditions that they have, and you might question whether it is a disability. Uh, there are three different categories under the ADA on how something might be defined as a disability. The first one is the obvious one. It's the one that we all know about. It's a physical or a mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity. Um, activities. So it's actually having that impairment. That's straightforward. The second one is having a record of such impairment, maybe at some point in the past. And the third one, the most unusual, is they do not have a an actual impairment, but you, the employer, regard them as having such, and you uh, treat them that way, and you take action um, based on that, then they're also going to be covered as being disabled, as having a disability, at least for purposes of the ADA. So this comes into play. The actual impairment comes into play more recently, uh, not because COVID or the coronavirus is a disability, because it is not, it is a virus, but uh, your employees are likely suffering from some underlying conditions that may pose higher risk due to COVID, and certainly COVID may cause a disability down the road. Um, so the next part is, uh, what does it mean to be a qualified individual with a disability? So you are qualified, and this is this is perhaps the most important part of the ADA uh, and the most overlooked in the analysis, but it is someone who can perform the essential functions of the position with or without a reasonable accommodation. So the ADA, when it was passed, was not passed to enable people uh, to get out of doing their job. The ADA was passed uh, to ensure that employers found ways to help the disabled person do their job. So the accommodations that we'll be discussing, they are only reasonable if they permit the person to perform the essential functions of the job. So let's go on to the next screen and talk about accommodations. So these are some of the most common accommodations that have been requested over the years. Um, job restru job restructuring, uh, restructuring uh, policy modifications, reassignment to different uh, positions. Before COVID, this slide would lead up to me discussing the second to last one, time off or leave as an accommodation. That, that, that has always been the hot topic. That has been what our circuit courts of appeal have been 
uh, wrestling with is whether, uh, similar to the FMLA, we have to continue to give time off. Uh, but if you go back to to what I said on the prior screen about what it means to be a qualified individual, it is it is someone who can perform the essential functions of the job. And so the accommodation is only reasonable if it allows them to perform the essential functions of the job. And uh, generally, many courts have been saying that that means now or in the immediate, um, immediate future. So for our employees who are asking for leave, at least under the ADA, the problem there is if they are on leave, they are not doing what? They're not doing any job functions. And so uh, many courts, and let's set California and the Ninth Circuit aside for right now, most courts are saying that uh, uh, that indefinite leave and in certain uh, circuits, leave of more than a few weeks or a few months is going to be per se unreasonable because it doesn't let the employee do their job. Okay, that's leave. Um, my guess is if your employees are like many of our clients that I've been speaking to, leave is not the big one that's being requested. If they need leave, then likely they are finding it under the FMLA or, or the expanded FMLA. Now the issue is telecommuting. And so that's what we will discuss now. So is telecommuting a reasonable accommodation? Well, it depends, because we can't just say that an accommodation in the abstract is reasonable or unreasonable. It all depends on what that person's job is, because remember, we have to go back to whether that accommodation, and here it's telecommuting, whether that, if we, the employer, make it to where that employee can telecommute, can he or she now perform the essential functions of the job? So when is working from home a reasonable accommodation? Well, here you look at things like the employer's ability to supervise that employee remotely, the need for that employee to use equipment, and can that equipment be used at home, the need for face-to-face -face interaction and coordination of work with other employees or clients. Uh, this was a big issue in the seminal case in this area for for any legal nerds out there that want to go and do some more reading on this, the big case was EEOC versus Ford Motor Company. And it was an en banc decision back in 2015 that walked through this for um, for a salesperson who wanted to be able to work remotely. And they, they talked a lot about how important this face-to-face -face interaction and coordination with coworkers and clients was. But I'll come back to that. Uh, the last one, whether the position requires access to documents or information located at the work site. So, so again, uh, that, that's what you would typically look at to see if telecommuting would enable that person to perform the essential functions of the job. Now, did COVID change all of this? Well, no, it didn't change the legal analysis. Those are still the same questions that we need to be asking. But I think we can all agree that in many of our companies, uh, this has drastically changed how our companies do business and what uh, your company, what employers are now permitting employees to do out of maybe necessity that they had never done in the past. There's an increased reliance on technology, and I think this has demonstrated in many areas what is possible and what can be effective. So when you go back and look at these factors under the first bullet point, uh, many of these have likely changed in the COVID era. My guess is many of your companies have invested in additional technology to make remote work possible. Uh, my guess is the need for face-to-face -face interaction. We have seen that uh, some of that face-to-face -face interaction can be accomplished via video conferencing. And same with the ability to supervise employees and using um, equipment at home. So. So the, the legal analysis uh, hasn't changed, but I think a lot of the factors have changed. And so where we need to be cautious is uh, saying that telecommute, uh, telecommuting is not reasonable, that we're not going to permit that accommodation because it can't allow the person to really successfully perform the essential functions of the job. Now we have four or five months, though, of history and of data and of performance for those employees to where we really need to go and check, is that true? Um, is that true anymore? Can our employees really perform the essential functions of the job now, at least maybe on a temporary 
basis. Maybe it's a day or two a week. Maybe it's a short term period. Is that now possible? All right, let's get to the next one. So what, uh, so how does this accommodation request process go? So, uh, so this process under the ADA is called the, uh, the interactive process and it is a process. And for those of you who have had to go through it, it can be a lengthy process and it is back and forth. And that is what is intended. It's very, it's very fact intensive. But the first step is always going to be is, well, most of the time going to be the employee or the applicant's request for an accommodation. It's not going to be you soliciting them uh, or going and asking them whether they need an accommodation. Now, the exception is if it's an obvious disability and the need for an accommodation is obvious. So if I walk in for a uh, to be a typist and I don't have any arms, uh, then sure, that's open and obvious. We can start to have that conversation. Uh, but it's important. We don't want to go out and seek out the disabled employees and send an email blast to employees to see who needs accommodations, because what do you think is going to happen? You're going to be overwhelmed with people requesting accommodations that they never really even thought of before. Now, it's important to still have the accommodation policy and make sure that your that your handbook and your employee policies are up to date that have that information to provide employees with information should they go and look for it, but it's not necessary. And in fact, I wouldn't recommend uh, going out to find employees who need accommodations and soliciting them for that, because then you, you will be overwhelmed with people seeking illegitimate accommodations. Uh, lastly here, though, it is important to pay attention to both formal and informal, written and verbal notifications of problems. They need not come into your office and say, I need an accommodation under the ADA, right? Uh, so we need to make sure that our first level managers are trained to be attentive to, to when it might be necessary. So if, uh, so if someone goes to a manager and is having a personal conversation with him or her and mentions this disability and how hard it is for him or her to, to do one of the essential functions of the job, uh, those first line managers should be trained enough to be able to come and flag that for, for the HR professionals to be able to dig deeper and to start that interactive process. Now you'll notice for those of you who are familiar with the ADA, there are two words that I have not said throughout the presentation and, and that's been intentional and that is the undue hardship. Uh, why? Because I don't think it has any place in the workplace analysis. Um, if it does, it's in, it's in very few instances during which you should be in consultation with legal counsel about whether you're really going to rely on that during the accommodation process and the interactive process. Because, again, focus on whether the request is reasonable, whether if we give you this accommodation, uh, you will be able to perform the essential functions of the job. If not, then it is not reasonable and we do not have to give you that accommodation. We don't even get to the undue hardship um, stage, which I think is a very high bar and should be saved if you unfortunately get into litigation. All right, last one here. Uh, what are your rights when an accommodation is requested? And this is important, um, especially now if you start to receive a flood of accommodation requests. Do you, do you just simply have to roll over and assume the person has the disability? And that, and that that accommodation is, 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 uh, the way to go. And the answer is no. The, uh, the guidance that we have says that you are able to ask that employee questions. Again, this is during that interactive process. You can ask questions that will enable your company to make an informed decision about the request, including the type of accommodation that's needed. So you have to be able to establish that the person does in fact have a disability. You don't have to take their word for it in the email. You can require medical documentation from the person's health care provider, as long as the disability, again, is not open and obvious uh, to you. So if it's some sort of, you know, lung condition, um, if, it is, if it is diabetes or sleep apnea, for example, that's not going to be open and obvious to you. Uh, not only do you need to request the person has a disability, but then it goes on to step two where we're talking about what does what does the accommodation do for that particular disability? Is the healthcare provider saying that this accommodation would help the person perform the essential functions of the job? Because simply having a disability doesn't need, 
mean you need an accommodation. If I have uh, sleep apnea, that might not mean that I need to telecommute, right? So there's got to be a connection between those two, and we can rely on healthcare providers to provide current medical documentation about the request um, and the requested accommodation. Finally here, you are not stuck with the accommodation that your employee requests. For example, if they are at heightened risk because of an underlying condition that is a disability, but the medical provider is saying that if uh, certain safety protocols are followed and, and uh, PPE is provided or mandated on site and that those would be equally effective, to accommodate the disability, as would telework, then you, the employer, can choose among the equally effective, reasonable accommodations. You're not stuck with the only one that the employee might be requesting. So for that, I'll turn it over. Uh, that's the foundation. I'll turn it over to Hannah, and we'll get into how pregnancy ties into all of this. Great. Thank you, Brian. And as Brian said, I'm Hannah Caldwell. I'm located in our Cleveland office. So. We've received many questions recently involving pregnant employees and pandemic-related concerns related to their return to work. So let's dive into some of those questions. So to set a baseline, the CDC's guidance on pregnant people at this time is that pregnant people might be at an increased risk for severe illness from COVID-19. And additionally, there may be an increased risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes, such as preterm birth, among pregnant people with COVID-19. So next slide, please. So in light of this uncertainty and sort of wishy-washy guidance from the CDC, back in June, the EEOC posted new updates addressing COVID-19-related questions and answers arising under the federal equal opportunity laws as applied to pregnant people. So among other things, guidance makes it clear that Title VII prohibits covered employers from involuntarily excluding workers from the workplace based on their pregnancy, even when that exclusion is based on benevolent reasons, such as protecting the employee due to their potential higher risk for severe illness due to COVID-19. And further, the publication from the EEOC provides various approaches that employers may adopt as they plan for their pregnant employees returning to the workplace. And some of those approaches include providing information to all employees on who to contact with requests for disability accommodations or other flexibilities related to pregnancy, inviting employees to make any requests in advance, that the employer should consider on an individualized basis. And finally, the guidance said that an employer may also choose to allow telework or may choose to discuss with these event individuals if they would like to postpone their return to work date. So next slide, please. So as Brian described a little bit ago, there are certain circumstances in which an employer is required to provide employees with reasonable accommodations. And pregnancy can sometimes trigger the obligation to provide them. So as to concerns about pregnancy during the pandemic, there are two main federal employment discrimination laws that may trigger accommodation for employees based on their pregnancy. And these are the Americans with Disabilities Act, which Brian has already discussed, and Title VII as amended by the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, or PDA. So let's go to the next slide and talk about these respective laws. So as Brian described for you earlier, the ADA prohibits employment discrimination against a qualified individual with a disability. Now, pregnancy-related medical conditions may themselves be disabilities under the ADA, but pregnancy itself is not considered an ADA disability. So where an employee requests a reasonable accommodation due to a pregnancy-related medical condition, the employer must consider it under the usual ADA rules and engage in the interactive process that Brian described for you a few minutes ago. So on the next slide, Brian's going to describe a few other ADA considerations you should keep in mind. Brian? Yeah, thanks, Hannah. So, so a common request that we've been seeing that I'm sure many of you have been seeing is we have employees coming to us and they've been asking for accommodations. Um, it might be leave, it might be teleworking, 
and they they want it because of a disability. But the the important distinction is that they want it for a disability that is not their own. They are either living with or being exposed to maybe a spouse, a child, a parent who has a disability, who is at a higher risk of severe illness if they uh, contract COVID because of their own underlying medical condition. And so here, this is an area where the ADA is not going to come into play because the employee is asking for an accommodation related to a disability that they themselves do not have. And so in that world, the ADA uh, does not come into play. Okay, great. Thanks, Brian. So next slide, please. So as we've discussed, due to the pandemic, employers may not exclude employees from the workplace involuntarily due to pregnancy. So under Title VII, as amended by the PDA, um, sex discrimination includes discrimination based on pregnancy. And the PDA specifically requires that women affected by pregnancy, childbirth, and related medical conditions be treated the same as others who are similar in their ability or inability to work. Next slide, please. So accordingly, a pregnant employee may be entitled to job modifications, including telework, changes to work schedules or assignments, and leave, to the extent that that leave is provided for other employees who are similar in their ability or inability to work. So in light of this guidance, employers should make sure that their supervisors, managers, and HR personnel know how to handle such requests to avoid disparate treatment in violation of Title VII. So in a nutshell, to wrap up here, there are not a ton of additional protections afforded to pregnant women because of the pandemic. And it's also unlikely, absent some other pregnancy-related impairment, that a pregnant employee would be entitled to a reasonable accommodation because of a COVID-19 exposure risk. So, Brian, unless you have anything else to add, we'll move on now to Keith with a discussion on um, various federal and state orders. Sounds good. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks, Hannah. Obviously, disability and pregnancy-related disabilities have been a significant issue during COVID-19, even if they aren't necessarily um, directly related to an individual's need to quarantine. But for our final topic, I'll ask Keith Spiller in our Cincinnati office and Sarah Hamilton in our Atlanta office to discuss federal and state orders regarding COVID-19 that are impacting the workplace. Thank you, Megan, and good afternoon to everybody. This is Keith Spiller, and I'm going to start off our discussion of um, state and local laws and orders by talking about employee travel. When um, I was asked to talk about travel, I was thrilled because those who know me know that it's one of my favorite subjects in the world to talk about, although admittedly with the potential for quarantines and testing that follows travel, it's taken on a, a little less fun uh, um, point of view lately. But um, it has raised a host of, I would say, thorny issues for many of our clients. And I thought what we would start with this afternoon was some common questions that we have gotten from our clients. Um, and I'm guessing you will have some of those same. And then I'll spend the rest of the time, hopefully, um, answering those questions. So let's start out with uh, a couple of those. Uh, one that I got recently was, can I prevent my employee from traveling this summer to Florida for vacation? As we know, Florida is a hot spot, uh, and um, a lot of folks obviously are wrapping up their summer travel before school starts. So what, what can I do as an employer? What are my rights? We'll, we'll touch on that uh, momentarily. And then if I do allow that employee to go to Florida, what do they have to do when they get back? Do they have to quarantine? How long? all those things about return to work. Um, there's just a ton of issues that are raised by that. Uh, one of those is, do I have to pay them for the quarantine? Um, we, we touch, we'll touch on that. Um, what happens if I have an employee who is quarantined after travel um, and they decide to go get a test and test negative? Can I bring them back to work relying on that negative COVID test? 
Uh, another question, and, and this is one that has engendered a lot of discussion here internally, um, is my employee has decided to intentionally go to a hot spot on vacation. Uh, and then understanding that because it's a hot spot, that specific locality where they'll return to may require a quarantine for two weeks or does require a quarantine for two weeks. Uh, then they, in essence, take a, a week's vacation and turn that into a three-week vacation because they have to quarantine when they get back. Can I stop them from going? Uh, we'll, we'll touch on that. Um, a couple are sort of the flip side of that, which is what about restrictions? The opposite sort of aspect of this issue is when can we send our sales group back on the road? Um, a lot of companies are beginning to dip their toe into business travel again. Uh, we'll uh, share some experiences we have on that. And then lastly, um, what do I do if my employees do not want to travel, if they do not feel safe doing that? Uh, can I force them to go back on the road? So let's start with an analysis or a quick overview of the laws that have been issued on travel restrictions in case you missed those. Um, I have listed here um, in the PowerPoint uh, the current states, uh, and I'd say current in air quotes, because virtually every day we see some change in these laws, uh, both from a state and local location. Uh, but these are the states that, uh, at last check, had issued travel restrictions. Um, some of those, as you will see, I have listed as voluntary. Um, Boise, um, for instance, uh, Ohio, where we are based, is a voluntary statute, which basically says if you go to certain hot, sp hot spots and you come back, it is not a requirement when you come back to Ohio to quarantine, but uh, according to the governor's order, he recommends it. Um, so if you see voluntary afterwards, that's what that typically means. Um, international travel is a whole different um, kettle of fish. Um, Canada, Mexico, there are restrictions on um, non-tourism tourism travel there. Uh, and certainly with the EU, we have um, do not have the ability to travel there. Um, if, um, you know, the traveling parties are Americans. So that's sort of the, um, what, what the, the, the states and, and cities that have issued, uh, protocol. Um, and this is important for a reason we'll touch on in a second. Um, a couple things to note. Most of those orders in the states have a 24 hour minimum stay trigger. So if you are connecting through a state, for instance, or you're driving through a state, for instance, on your vacation, that does not trigger sort of compliance obligations with that particular state. Uh, I'll give you an example uh, that will prove that point. And then lastly, um, some states' uh, orders are requiring quarantine or a negative test. Um, so, again, um, very important to actually pull out the order of the states involved and look at what they are requiring because there is not uniformity state to state and city to city about their obligations. Some have them in stay requirements, some do not. Um, some require uh, or require quarantine regardless of tests. Some actually um, can't allow the, the negative test to, uh, to end the quarantine. So good rule here, pull your statute out that's applicable or statute or statutes that's applicable and look at them to see how they apply to your specific situation. The next slide, I'm going to start with um, some tips that are applicable to employee travel, both business travel and personal travel. Uh, and then the rest of the slide deck that I'm going to talk through will sort of be divided into business travel and then personal travel. So these are the generic tips that really apply to every type of travel. Um, and, and this is a, a, a key point and a key slide for you all to understand. Uh, and that is for each trip that your employee is contemplating taking, you need 
to at least look at two sets of travel orders or two state or local laws. And those two are the destination locations, in other words, where they're going. And you need to look at that to understand what happens to the employee when they arrive at that destination. And then secondarily, you need to look at the home order, which is um, the, the state or locality when, that is applicable when that employee returns from the trip. To get a full sense of whether travel is permissible and also what has to happen when that person gets to the destination and then when they get back home, you need to look at both of those state laws. And a very important point to, to think through. And I'll give you an example of that. So let's say there's an employee uh, of yours who lives in Southern Ohio. Um, of those of you who know uh, Southern Ohio understand that our airport is actually in Kentucky. Um, so the employee lives in Ohio, leaves CBG in Northern Kentucky for a Chicago client meeting that is deemed critical by the business. Uh, because they are a Delta frequent flyer, they decide to, to fly through Atlanta. Um, as you know or may know, Georgia is on many of the hotspot lists um, in other states and locales. Um, and Chicago is important because Chicago is one of the few cities that actually have also issued travel restrictions. Um, and that, in, in Chicago's case, is also a 14-day quarantine. So when that employee arrives in Chicago, having left Cincinnati through Kentucky, through Atlanta, uh, does that employee have to quarantine? And, and the answer is um, no. Um, and, and the reason why is because neither Kentucky nor Ohio today are on the city of Chicago's hot list. And this brings up another point, which is even if you pull out Chicago's list and you've looked at it two or three weeks ago, they update their hot list based on the number of infections and that list changes every week. Um, and so you need to continually to re review uh, the locations orders to make sure you've got the most up-to-date list because that does change. Um, so neither Kentucky nor Ohio are on Chicago's hot list. Georgia is, or at least was at the time I created this hypothetical, but again, city of Chicago has an exemption that says if they fly through and just connect less than 24 hours, the Atlanta touchdown does not constitute sort of you coming from Atlanta, from Georgia. So in this particular location, this particular trip, there would not be a requirement to quarantine when they arrive in Chicago. But remember, that's only half the battle. Before we talk about the other end of that, I do want to raise one point. The city of Chicago, its order is applicable only within the city. So, for instance, like many uh, clients there in Oak Brook, instead of um, the proper city, um, this statute and the order of Chicago would not be applicable. So now, we've talked about the destination issue. Let's talk about the return issue. So when that employee comes back to Ohio, do they have to quarantine? So currently under Ohio law, the answer is no, because it is just a recommendation under government, uh, under DeWine's most recent order. Not a requirement to quarantine, it is a recommendation. Um, but let's change those facts. Let's say that instead the employee who's traveling lives in New York, obviously a hot spot, travels to Walt Disney World with his or her family for a family vacation, Disney World, obviously, in Florida um, and is also a hot spot. What are the ramifications of that? Do they have to quarantine upon arrival at the Walt Disney World? Yes. Do they have to quarantine when they come back to New York? Yes. And the reason is Florida has um, the triumvirate of states, New York, I think Connecticut and New Jersey, that they consider to be hot spots and require quarantine upon arrival. And obviously New York uh, has reciprocated and has a requirement um, of quarantine upon return from specific states, including Florida. So proving the point I made earlier, you've got to look at both sides of the uh, equation 
when you are uh, traveling for personal or for business. And the rules change, so um, take a look frequently to understand what the obligations are in the applicable states. Shifting gears a little bit, um, let's talk about disclosures um, and what an employer can and should require their employees who are traveling to disclose. So we're seeing quite a number of our clients begin to request location disclosures as part of the vacation approval process. Um, that is permitted. Um, I think it's a good idea in particular now. Business travel, you obviously understand where they're going, you're sending them, um, but um, particularly for personal travel, this is a situation where uh, we think employers should ask for locations, <clears throat> given that we've got, uh, you know, a lot of different levels of, of hot spots going on throughout the U.S. Um, it, it is important to understand that first, so you can do that part one of the equation, understand what they've got to do when they get there, but then understand, too, what they've got to do when they get back. Um, you're, you're, uh, some of the things that our employers have been asking their employees about include dates, method of travel, including connections, because, like I said, most but not all uh, statutes have the connection exemption in them, and then obviously location. Um, and both Megan and Debbie made this point, and it is an important one, and I'll make it again. Be consistent. The way you can get into trouble with these rules is applying them um, inconsistently, um, only asking certain people, um, you know, for their information. If you're going to do it, require it for everybody, or at least come up with a rule that is, for instance, all of the hot spot, if you're going to a hot spot, uh, you have to give the information, you have to disclose the information. Um, so that's, you know, obviously figure out what your rule is going to be and then apply it um, without regard to who is making the request. So sticking still with the general travel tips, let's talk a little bit about quarantine. So what if in Ohio, the employer really wants to quarantine the employees who, who decide to take personal travel, um, and the state orders are voluntary and not uh, a requirement to quarantine. Um, I think the answer to that question as an employer is, yeah, if, if you apply the rule in a non-discriminatory manner, um, I don't see really any reason why you cannot require quarantines of your employees. Now, will it be popular? Absolutely not. Will your employees be very upset? They will. But in terms of whether you can do it or not, um, uh, obviously there's exemptions for employees with specific contracts or labor employees that are uh, working under a collective bargaining agreement, and that sort of rule really applies universally here. Uh, but in, in the absence of those in an at-will employment environment, I think you can require a quarantine even if the state orders do not. Um, next question, can I ask my quarantine employee to work remotely? Absolutely you can. Uh, now, we know that some jobs are not able to be worked remotely, um, and that's got to play in here, but uh, assuming this is a job that has been in the past or can be worked remotely, Yes, you can have your employee work during the time in which they are required to be at home. A little more on quarantine. Pay during quarantine. Um, a lot of questions around this we've seen. Um, Debbie touched on this and gave you some good details about that. The thing to remember, which she, she pointed out, is you got to understand whether the quarantine is pursuant to an order or required by doc or do the symptoms. If it is and the employee still has FFCRA leave, um, then the pay is, um, is paid. Um, if it's not uh, or FFCRA is not applicable to you because of your size, uh, then from a statutory standpoint, the pay, there's no obligation to necessarily pay for the quarantine time. Now, you do want to look at your policies, and, you know, obviously there are statutory obligations and there are 
your internal policy obligations. So you got to, this would be a good time to dust off your, your vacation policies, see what it looks like, um, and issue, uh, and I'll come back to this point when we're talking about business travel, issue an updated or, or uh, vacation travel <clears throat> policy that is specific to COVID. Uh, that you can um, take away when COVID, the COVID issue is resolved. Um, and what I would also say is we are seeing, um, even if the policies don't specifically allow for it, uh, we are seeing some employers who are allowing PTO usage to cover quarantine time, even though, again, the policies may not provide for it. It's simply something they're doing. But again, consistency here is critical. You get yourself into trouble by um, applying different rules to different similarly situated folks. So um, I, I want to come back to this issue of um, a, a sort of quarantine and a watch out. And I raised this before. Um, I wish I had a better answer for our clients who have employees who are taking advantage of them. And what they're doing is purposefully scheduling a, a trip to a, a personal trip to a hotspot uh, from a state that they have to quarantine upon return. So in essence, they turn in perhaps a week or two weeks of vacation into uh, uh, more leave, and it's particularly galling for those employers who are covered by the Families First Act uh, and who have these employees who have not taken uh, FFCRA leave, because then if it is a mandatory quarantine or they're having symptoms, um, then you have a situation where this employee is taking two weeks of PTO, followed by two weeks of paid leave for them to hang out at the house. Um, uh, not a lot of things we can do about it, although I will say one bright spot, New York has closed this loophole by making uh, voluntary travelers to hotspots not eligible for their sick leave, um, specific sick leave laws. Now, again, that's not the federal act. That is a New York COVID sick leave issue. Um, so hopefully we'll see some more states that, uh, that, that um, treat this in the same way. Um, we've not seen a lot of traction there. So moving on, let's talk about testing um, and in the context of the return to work protocol. So, um, we touched on this a bit, but I'll, I'll raise it again. We can, as employer, require the employee, returning employee to answer questions about their symptoms. Um, this is uh, something that may not be permitted um, outside of the pandemic. The EOC has told us we can do that. Um, we can require negative tests for employees who travel outside their state. Um, you know, again, are you going to do that, though, and you need to make this consideration up front for everybody who travels outside their states or for just those who travel to hot spots? Um, you know, I don't care where you come out on that, but I would say, again, be consistent in your application. Uh, one point I would raise, though, is with the requirement of negative testing who's, who, for folks who come back um, and are quarantined, you know, is that – practical given the difficulty and shortage of testing? Um, is that practical given the delay in test results? Uh, I'm not going to answer that question, but it's something for you all to be thinking about. Next slide, I want to continue talking a little bit more about testing. Um, you know, what about a release? So, you know, let's say I decide not to get testing, not to require that because of all the practicalities. Can I require a doctor release before returning to work? Yes, uh, employers are permitted to do that. Um, I, I think this, the, the, the next bullet is really an important part here. You know, put a policy together that or at least a communication with employees about travel and, and about what they are, they should be expecting, uh, what you're requiring, what's going to happen. Think through the process, look at your, look at your orders and come up with uh, a communication because it's going to resolve a lot of questions and a lot of potential employer relations issues 
for your employees to get back and, and, and really had a misunderstanding about what was expected or required. Um, so please think about that. Uh, we're, we're happy to help you put those testing uh, return to work sort of programs together. Um, you know, should you require, should, should, should you return to work an employee who tests negative before the quarantine expires? I think the answer to that question is no, at least in the first three to five days. What we have seen, and obviously we're not medical doctors, but the, the protocol and the, and the CDC uh, information we have tells us that tests can be able to, to detect um, the virus in the first few days after exposure. So just because somebody has a test, uh, has a test that is negative, um, doesn't necessarily mean we should just say, okay, welcome back. Um, and we've seen, um, you know, again, our, our, uh, governor here in the state of Ohio, Governor DeWine tested positive and then they determined that was a mistake and he was actually negative. So there is some, some, uh, variance in, in testing. So I think the proper way to do this is to really, uh, think through and, and make sure that folks are, if, if you got a 14 day quarantine, make them serve it. All right, so let's talk about business travel and then personal travel. So business travel, what we've seen is a lot of folks outlawing this uh, or at the very least curtailing it. I've touched on some of these issues, but I'll, I'll raise them again. You know, make sure you get have somebody pre-approving travel within your business, whether it's HR, some other high-level manager, really important. Uh, and understand it's got to be an important meeting to travel. Um, talked about the third point there, make sure you understand the laws, uh, and then issue a policy. Next page, you know, workers' comp is an interesting issue. It is not my specialty, but I've done a little bit of research on this issue and for a client. And what we learned is, obviously, workers' comp is a state-by-state -state issue. But if I could generalize, um, typically, unless I would say, the job is um, it, it, it is has conditions that um, I would say are particular to that job and which sort of fosters the COVID exposure. In most states, the the a, a, a COVID employee who or an employee who contracts COVID while on a business trip would likely not be covered for workers' comp. Um, again, state by state variance here. Um, you need to make sure that um, uh, you also check your own state's laws because some of them have presumptions for coverage for certain jobs, like your first responders, like your grocery workers even, like your healthcare workers. So understand what your laws are, but uh, we may be seeing those types of claims based on business travel if the employee can establish that, in fact, they got the COVID while on business travel. So the last sort of couple of key points on business travel, when can we do it, right? Um, I mean, there's no real law out there to tell you the answer to that question. I, I think it depends on three things. One, the tolerance of your and interest of your employee. Two, what is your customer or your client, you know, who, who you're going to meet with? What do they want? I mean, most of our clients have not expressed any interest in having uh, us come see them quite yet. Perhaps that's just they don't want to see me. I don't know. It's possible. But most of them don't. Um, and we, you got to appreciate that. And then lastly, really, how compelling of a need is this uh, meeting anyway? We have succeeded with Zoom uh, in a large degree. Uh, it's not perfect, but, you know, business has continued. Do you really need the business travel? Conversely, do you and can we require our employees to travel? I think you can, um, assuming there's no prohibitions to the area uh, by government authorities. Um, if it is some jobs, you know, traveling salesperson, right? Uh, that could be essential. Uh, but I think the answer, again, is should you require it? I think you're going to have some employees who are going to resent your requirement. Uh, you might have some PPE, some personal protective equipment reimbursement obligations. And then if they complain about it, you got to be a little careful because if they're complaining on a part of a group, it could be considered to be 
protected and concerted uh, under the National Labor Relations Act, even if these are not union employees. And lastly, on this point about requiring business travel, you know, we've had a lot of questions about whether waivers um, are make sense. Um, our general advice have been they do not. Uh, they are typically not enforceable. Um, and um, I just, it's not been something we have recommended largely. Um, just spend a couple of moments on personal travel. Uh, it's definitely murkier than business travel because unlike um, business travel, which we can control, you know, employees feel like they are, um, you know, they are, have the, have the right and, and have an accrued benefit that they want to use. Um, the question, obviously, on a lot of people's mind is, can we prohibit personal travel? Um, I think the answer to that question is probably yes, if the employee in question is at will, and if your state where you operate has no off-duty conduct laws. What do I mean by that? Uh, there are a number of states, I think at least half of them that I've seen, have some law that protects off-duty behavior. These are typically like, if you smoke, you can't be discriminated against by your employer. If you have free, if you exercise your free speech rights, you can't be discriminated by your employer because of that. The problem is a lot of these are written in a broad enough manner to possibly cover the right to personal travel. And if so, we've got potential issues. Uh, I will ask the same question, however, about personal travel as, as, um, you know, uh, business travel, which is, should we? Maybe we can, but should we prohibit it? Obviously, an enormous employee relations issues. Employees think that their time that they have accrued, they're entitled to use it and how they see fit. Um, and I'm probably doubtful that your current policies support a denial of personal travel, even if it is to a hot spot. Um, I would say the one exception could possibly be if that employee works in a high-risk setting where um, they are interacting with others. That's part of their job. So with that, I will turn it over to Sarah to uh, continue our discussion and talk a little bit about the federal updates. Great. Thank you, Keith. Uh, my name is Sarah Hamilton. I'm in the Atlanta office, and I'm going to just go briefly over some federal updates and um, uh, end with the very fun topic of payroll taxes. So uh, just uh, on the OSHA end, you know, uh, something new that we've been seeing in this pandemic is, you know, employers typically know OSHA really well because they're in manufacturing, they're in an industry that's required training and things like that, or they're kind of office, uh, you know, based things that are still subject to OSHA but just have never really worked with it before. So um, OSHA covers everyone, although people with less than the 10 employees are, are a little bit less stringent uh, requirement. So OSHA um, is is a big deal right now uh, because they have taken the position that um, it's their number one priority right now to, to look at COVID-19 and eliminate its hazards. And so um, it has said in, 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 in various pieces it's released in terms of the guidance that, uh, you know, prioritizing um, or in preventing kind of COVID-19 workplace transmissions and fatalities and hospitalizations is its number one uh, priority for inspections and citations right now. So it's focusing on high-risk workplaces, which it has identified as healthcare providers, uh, but it's also focusing on workplaces that have a high number of complaints or known COVID-19 cases. So, you know, you might have been an office-based, you know, I'll just pick on law firms for a second, never had an OSHA issue in your life. Um, and if you start getting kind of cases like that, how this usually happens is the employees will just go file a complaint. Um, and once that kind of starts getting at OSHA's radar, you know, they can come at any time, uh, show up at your front door and do an inspection. So, um, in, in lieu of, in, they're still doing some on-site inspections, but they have moved a lot of it to kind of what they're calling a remote inspection or using a non-formal type of investigation, which really just consists of them sending a lot of information and questions to the employer and demanding a response in a very, very quick turnaround time. Uh, so next slide. Um, I just looked these up a couple days ago. So as of August 6th, you can see there's been, and these are just COVID-19 complaints. There's been almost 8,000 
federal OSHA complaints on COVID alone, although a good percentage of them have been closed. And then many states also have kind of a state OSHA that um, in many cases works hand in hand with the federal OSHA. And just again, only COVID complaints, there's been over 21,000 of those uh, with about uh, 14,000 closed. So this is a very prevalent issue where people have never dealt with OSHA suddenly have this problem. Um, I was looking up their kind of past enforcement recently with COVID and um, just a couple of things. Um, they, there was a pretty significant fine issued to um, a healthcare facility after seven employees were hospitalized. Um, you know, this, this is different than many uh, other types of employers because where, where respirators are required under specific kind of OSHA guidelines, there's other requ technical requirements about having to do training and things like that um, that wouldn't necessarily apply to other types of employers. But I think the key lesson from this one is it, it's not enough if, if you're in those categories that have those requirements. Um, you know, it's not enough to provide it. You still have to comply with the technical requirements. Um, there was another fine issued uh, recently to an employer who had some employees hospitalized with COVID-19. Um, it wasn't as significant a fine. It was less than $10,000. And I think what's interesting about this fine is that it was classified as other than serious. That's a type of fine that is considered less serious than a willful or intentional fine. Um, and so I'll talk about that on the next slide about how this kind of all relates together with um, COVID. Actually, I'll talk about it on the next slide. But the, the main thing right now is, you know, every employer, whether you've had positive cases or not right now, um, should have an injury and illness prevention plan, and you should conduct training on that plan, even if it's limited only to managers. And the reason that you need this type of plan is because what we've seen from the enforcement end is as soon as there's kind of cases or there's no cases and the employees go and complain to OSHA anonymously and you get one of these kind of rapid inspection, you know, email, here's all these questions, please email us back in like three days. Um, you want to have all of that stuff ready in terms of here's, here's what we looked at to make changes in our workplace and here's when we were able to implement them. And, and having all of that data ready so that you can turn it around to OSHA within three business days if you need to, if you are subject to one of these rapid inspections. So in terms of specifically, you know, what you should be looking for to put on your plan, it really depends on your type of workplace, your, your other OSHA technical requirements that you're already subject to. But OSHA has actually released a couple uh, pretty substantial documents on their website. Um, one's called the Guidance on Preparing Workplaces for COVID-19, and one's Guidance on returning to work, and they basically go through a very long list of, of things, and it's, it's, it's sufficient generally that if you go through that list and, and apply everything that you're able to um, and make a list of that and keep track of when you made the decision, when you implemented it, and have all those um, in place and call it your injury illness prevention plan, do a manager's meeting, talk about it at the manage, manager's meeting, or conduct a training so that you can have all this stuff ready. Um, one one issue about the face coverings is, you know, OSHA's taken the position at this point that employers are not required to provide face coverings unless you're already in one of these industries where respirators are required. Uh, but they're strongly encouraging employers um, to do it as a type of um, control, a physical control um, in the workplace. Now, if masks or coverings, it, it can be a surgical mask, it doesn't have to be an N95, it could also be a face shield, which uh, many of our clients have found much more comfortable and less resistant among the employees. But um, if you provide those, it's not a substitution for social distancing. And when OSHA does an inspection, they're still going to want to see lots of social distancing um, everywhere in the break room, you know, taking out tables, moving desks around, installing plexiglass, and things like that. So just just keep that in mind. Um, you know, I I can't get into all the state plans, but you know, a lot of states and local jurisdictions are also having uh, requirements for reopening or for safety. So in New York, for example, uh, New York has issued. Uh, actually worksheets that all employers have to fill out based on their industry. And they have to fill out these worksheets and post them in a public place and then go online separately and sign an affirmation that they completed these worksheets and published them. So that's just an example of states. It really kind of depends um, where you are on that. Uh, so next slide. 
couple updates from OSHA. One, if you're in an industry that has a required training or audit or some type of assessment, and you know who you are, we're talking, you know, manufacturers, um, people that are already very familiar with OSHA. Um, OSHA is saying that they will not, well, they will take a very good faith approach towards if you're unable to conduct that training for whatever reason, because, you know, your industry is shut down, your workplace is shut down, things like that. But the employers still need to show their good faith efforts to try to do their training and document that. So if there's a way to do it remotely or there's other types of measures that you can implement to satisfy that, um, and if you reschedule and have the training as soon as you can, even if it's late, uh, OSHA has indicated that we will, we will take a very kind of forgiving uh, approach towards that in our enforcement. Um, th the second thing that I think has is, is been the really difficult part is the recording requirements. So this applies to all employers. OSHA covers all employers, although if you're less than 10 employees, um, sometimes your recording requirements aren't as strict, so keep that in mind. But if there is a case of COVID-19 that has been workplace related, there can be this duty to report it on your Form 300, which is your OSHA log of workplace injuries. And, and this is a very difficult determination to make because, um, you know, in some states, you know, if you want, if you put this down, are you admitting that they caught it at work? Uh, but if you don't put it down and then you become subject to one of these OSHA complaints and get inspected and they look at your logs and say you didn't put it down, then the, the fines for that are, are, is very, very substantial. They could be substantial. So to kind of clarify that tension, OSHA issued this guidance um, as of May 2020 and until it's it's revoked, which it hasn't been yet, is that they're basically saying we will exercise enforcement discretion if you just show us that you made a reasonable determination about whether to record COVID-19 cases on your OSHA log. And so they have this um, guidance online, and of course, reach out to us um, if you guys if if you guys ever have any questions. But what they want employers to do is basically interview employees and ask them three questions. How do you think you got COVID-19? Did you think you got the workplace? Um, lightly talk about their out, out of out of work activities and also review the kind of general workplace for whether it was hap it, it might have occurred there. So as long as employers are kind of conducting this and it should be done in a way that's very sensitive to the employee's privacy, hopefully just by HR, definitely not by the manager. Um, and, and you're doing this, I mean, OSHA didn't go as far as saying this, but they're really signaling that if you just in good faith conduct this investigation, we will kind of accept whatever, you know, decision you make about whether to report it on your log or not. Um, as part of this investigation, OSHA also wants employers to look at um, any other evidence that's available to it and um, any other evidence it might have that it was contracted at work. So. Anytime you get a case of COVID-19 at, at your workplace, even if you think it was at work or not, you should kind of go through this uh, process um, to make this determination. Uh, and, and this relates as well to the, to the fine I mentioned where OSHA, when they issued that fine to that, that uh, the employer who did not report it on their logs but had six hospitalizations, um, they classified the fine as other than serious and it was less than $10,000. So, um, just something to think about. All right, next slide. Quick updates on the uh, emergency paid leave and emergency family leave. So last week, a federal court um, kind of struck down some of the DOL's interpretation. So basically, you have the statute that says, you know, all the employers have to give paid leave and family leave. And then the DOL on top of that issues kind of what we call administrative rules that clarify certain parts of it as as clarification is needed. Now, when the DOL does that, they're not allowed to change the meaning of the statute. They're really just supposed to clarify it. So um, what this court did was the state of New York challenged these rules as saying, you know, you went beyond what the statute said, and um, the court actually agreed with that. So they ended up striking down four of the DOL's rules about how to interpret this. So I won't get too much into the legal kind of basis for it. I think the main practical considerations for employers at this point is uh, employers need to provide the emergency paid sick leave regardless of whether there's any other work available 
for the employee to do. The DOL's position used to be, you know, if there's other work available, you know, you can't do this, but now employers have to um, be able to provide this if they have a qualifying reason um, under the Act and can't work or telework. Uh, number two is, is providing um, the emergency family uh, medical leave to uh, employees of healthcare facilities who are not doctors or healthcare providers. So the DOL's position was that um, healthcare facilities, uh, well, they were exempt under the Act from providing this leave, uh, probably because Congress wants, you know, healthcare facilities to be in service, but the DOL took the position that that applies to every employee of the healthcare facility, not just your doctors. It applies to your office staff and your IT staff and, their, and your HR staff, but the, um, since that rule was struck down, now employers, if your healthcare facility should should provide this benefit to everyone who's basically not a healthcare provider. Um, number three is uh, pro allowing a both paid sick leave and family leave on an intermittent basis. So this was um, or without the employer's consent. So beforehand, the intermittent leave uh, required the employer employee to come to kind of an agreement about how that all would that would happen. And now, if they're otherwise qualified and they want to take it on an intermittent basis, the employers you're basically just going to have to allow that. Although you can still limit the paid sick leave to full day increments. Um, so that's still something the employer has control of. And finally, um, uh, allowing leave or paid sick leave without necessarily requiring documentation. Um, employers can and should still require documentation. You just shouldn't deny it if they're unable to provide the documentation if it's not practical or reasonable. So don't don't let down all your barriers at all. This, this really only applies as um, the employers who were outright refusing leave without the documentation because that did not take into account that it could be unforeseeable and there might be an emergency health situation where the employee is unable to get that leave or unable to submit the documentation, but they should still be kind of retroactively required to do that and the employer can still request that documentation at a later date. So those are the updates on that. Very last slide. Uh, oh, um, it's very important to document this and document it in the way that the DOL and the statute has said to document it. So you don't want to go outside of what the DOL is, is kind of saying what you can ask for because it could create kind of other ADA issues or things like that. But there's a regulation that the DOL has published which has been upheld and um, kind of actually just provides a list of what you can ask for to document this. And um, I recommend really that, that employers just have a checklist. Just make a checklist so that when people come and ask for this type of leave, you can just check it off. Did we get this? Did we get this? Okay, good. Um, very important note, the DOL has said that employers should document this even if you deny the leave. Um, and you certainly should keep, keep it and get all the paperwork if the leave is um, approved. So um, just make sure that um, you're keeping this somewhere and keeping it somewhere separate from the rest of the personnel file because it still would probably in some cases be an ADA record. Um, so the very last slide here um, is on the payroll taxes. So this leave, the emergency paid sick leave and the emergency family leave is fully refundable by the government. And so that's a really great part of this program. Um, so. When we say fully refundable, the max, up to the maximum amount of the wages paid by employers for these benefits um, will be basically refunded to the employer somehow. So the way this works is that you should, the employer should report the total kind of wages they paid out in giving these benefits as well as the uh, amount that can be fairly allocated to any health plan. So if the employee's out, you know, on 10 weeks of leave, but you maintain the group health plan coverage, you can also get the employer's contribution refunded. So the, these, this, all of this total amount should be reported on the Form uh, 941. And let's just say as an example that you, you know, gave out $10,000 of, of benefits in this point. If, if you, you can basically deduct this amount from your payroll taxes that you're going to pay to the government for actual wages paid out, um, you can take it as a deduction, or if it's too much, if so if the amount of wages you paid out is more than the taxes uh, that you would have deposited with the government, you would get a refund, 
Or if it's not enough, you can actually use the form and apply for a credit so you can get a cash kind of advance to cover the wages. So um, just be aware of, of how this works because it, it's really set up in a way that it shouldn't cause too much of a cash crunch to pay out these benefits um, and then get it refunded right away. Um, one other kind of note about this is that um, it also applies to the Medicare wages. So the Medicare payroll tax on the employer side is 1.45%. You still have to pay those taxes on the amount of qualified wages paid for leave, but you would get that amount refunded through the kind of the way they're structuring these, these tax credits. Um, now, on the wages paid for this program, you don't have to pay the Social Security tax uh, for the employer's portion, so you wouldn't get that refunded, but you don't have to pay it, so you end up kind of being equal on that. Um, two miscellaneous notes I'll make as well is don't forget under the um, most recent amendment to the to the payroll protection program that all employers are also allowed to fully defer their Social Security um, payments and deposits of, of the employer side taxes until the very end of this year. So if you have um, a cash shortage or are looking for ways to kind of preserve cash, uh, make sure you, you, you apply for and get that. You can do that even if you got a payroll protection loan. And um, don't, all, don't forget as well about the employer tax, um, payroll tax retention program. So this only is for people who did not get a payroll protection program loan, but um, you will be qualified as well for certain kind of tax credits. Um, employers of all sizes, there's no limit on it, although the amount of tax credits you get uh, kind of differs on your size, um, that you should also document all that and, and apply for that. So the payroll tax things, I mean, it could be its own presentation, but I think the, the long story short is um, all HR departments should be keeping the, the payroll tax credits in mind, both to get the refund for the leave and the paid sick leave they they um, they paid out, as well as deferring payroll taxes, as well as getting tax credits for uh, for keeping employees on payroll through the end of this year. So that's all I've got on that. I hope I didn't talk too fast, but we'll we'll post this on YouTube in case anyone wants to review it. And of course, we're available for questions as needed. So thank you very much. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks to all of you for sticking with us. We apologize for running a little bit over, but as I said at the outset. Our intent today was to be jam-packed with detailed information, and we hope that you found it informative. Immediately following this webinar, you will receive a short survey. We ask you take a few minutes to complete the survey and let us know how we did today. If you are not currently receiving our updates and invitations, we invite you to go to the Thompson Hine website and register to receive our mailings under the Publications tab. We issue regular updates on a variety of topics, including the coronavirus. Thank you for your interest in attending today's webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day and stay well.